<laughs> Hello. Hello. So this week our topic is labor unions, pros and cons. I will be taking a uh, a decidedly pro union stance, and uh, Luke will be telling me why I'm wrong. Yeah, I'll be questioning your perspective, and uh, I'm definitely of the belief that I am not very well versed in this subject yet. I'm still trying to learn the history, but I am definitely from a philosophical perspective that tends to be anti-union, and I am yeah. I'll try my best to pick away at your perspective to give you a better opportunity to. Explain why you're right. Uh, before we start, uh, what have you been reading this week? Well, uh, one thing that I was reading about was uh, the history of chattel slavery, or um, we're not chattel slavery. Uh, There's the term we're indentured servitude in okay. uh, early early American history, and apparently one of the reasons. I guess I'll tell you what book I'm reading, so it's just clear. It's called White Cargo by John. Uh, whoop, whoop, by John Jordan and Michael Wel Welsh and it's yeah it's a uh, one of the things I just learned about in that book is that when slaves were first or when in like basically children were brought over to America from Britain for cheap labor and lots of uh, Irish people and convicts and there was usually like a five-year contract that they were they were forced to work for five years in exchange for being brought over if it was a voluntary thing that they were coming over. And the reason why this was made the most sense early on is because people would usually die within five years. Most people died before the contract was up. And then as the uh, life expectation rose over time, it made more sense to actually buy slaves for life. And that's why it's so, or one of the reasons it transitioned to buying slaves for life is because the people who actually lived long enough that the investment in that made sense. Interesting. A dark economic fact about the evolution of slavery in America. The economics of slavery are just profoundly disturbing and sad. Like, yeah. <laughs> Well, actually, one thing that's optimistic about it is that uh, it was very, uh, it was expensive to keep slaves. And actually, uh, colonies that didn't have uh, slaves were actually out-competing ones that did and they were actually shut down and thought of as a threat. So there's one colony that emerged that had no slaves and they're all just in working together as equals and everyone shut that one down because they were producing, I think, five times the profit at the time. So yeah, it's nice to know that, you know, economically speaking, modern values outperform slavery. That is good to hear. One thing I've heard about uh, the Spanish colonies in particular, like Hispaniola and, uh, stuff like that is that uh, a lot of it was just a prestige thing. Like people came from a society where there were no slaves and being in like the bottom white rung of like colonial society meant you had a whole underclass underneath you. Whereas back in Spain, you would have been like a dirt farmer or whatever, like you could right. come to America. And a lot of, a lot of uh, the colonists were actually upset when they got there and they didn't like live in the lap of luxury and sort of the promises were not true. Yeah, seems like a common theme, a lot of not quite true promises. Yeah. The new world. Cool, uh, this week um, I watched a TED talk on uh, the economy of Team Fortress 2 cool. and they were proposing that it was an ideal model for currencies in particular and they talked at length about how the informal economy of TF2 has kept their informal currencies like extremely stable and uh, having healthy inflation and things like this. So that was pretty interesting. I'll link it in the <laughs> comments below. So uh, I guess I'll start with like a brief overview of uh, the history of unions. So um, I like uh, some people like to go all the way back to like masonry and Freemasons and things like that. Uh, and sort of like these uh, skilled trade monopolies. But the real, in my opinion, the real precursors of uh, modern day unions didn't start until around the 19th century. So in the 19th century, there started to be a movement in Europe of fencing off communal land. So previously in any like duchy or whatever, there'd be huge tracts of area that just anyone could farm on with the expectation that they would supply uh, taxes by doing that. So they'd let them farm this land for free and in return, 
they have income that can be taxed, whereas otherwise they'd have nothing. Um, but and during the Industrial Revolution, as you start to see like wealth accumulation, increasingly lords uh, fenced off these common lands and sold them, which left a lot of non-landowning farmers, which is the vast majority in most European countries, without uh, a way of earning a living. And then there's a max exodus of these people into cities where they become a very cheap form of labor. Uh, at the same time as you have industrialization where there's factories propping up everywhere and uh, there's suddenly a need for cheap, unskilled labor. And uh, this is good at first because it gives these people a way to work, but increasingly because labor was so, the labor market was so oversaturated, uh, there was really no incentive for factory owners to attract skilled labor or to uh, sort of, they didn't have to do any work to attract people to work at their factory because there was such a shortage of jobs. And uh, there was very little, if any, in the way of like safety regulations and things like this. And so like people, it was very common to see people with missing fingers and, uh, or just people dying, children worked in factories, things like this. And this was uh, increasingly seen as a, and long hours is another thing, like people would work like 16 hour days were like not uncommon. And so uh, sort of, I guess this eventually gets so extreme that you start to have the organized labor movement. So unions start to prop up. In the beginning, they're essentially gangs that, uh, of labor that band together and they say, okay, we're gonna demand these things from your employer. And uh, through often violent means, because there was no legal avenue, they would essentially like prevent scabs. So they'd say like, you're gonna to have to work with these people. And if you try to hire outside people, like we're gonna scare them off, keep them away. Uh, you'd hear things like they would uh, attack like factory owner mansions and things like that and stand outside. Uh, and they fought, and uh, on the other side, the factory owners petitioned their government and there was a lot of police breakups of these things. They would also hire more conventional unions like, or uh, more conventional gangs like La Cosa Nostra and things like that to break up strikes. Uh, although eventually most gangs became involved in organized labor instead. And sort of the end result is that uh, labor unions win these uh, big quality of life uh, wins, like the five day week that you're not gonna have people work on weekends, you're gonna have people work eight hours a day, um, you're not gonna have children working in factories, uh, and all of these things that sort of uh, rebalance things in the other way. So a lot of it and unfortunately, uh, a lot of this took the form of not allowing women in the workplace. Like a lot of the sexist laws came up in this time. But the end result is that you limited how many people could work because a lot of people who are underage or whatever weren't available to work and forced employers to set the standards higher. And there was sort of this rebalancing of the labor market that led into uh, kind of the glory days of the 1950s, 1960s, where people had very high standards of living. So it's certainly a mixed bag, but uh, ultimately, I think most people, it's so unfathomable to us to work like 16 hour days in a factory and lose fingers and things like that, that it shows that unions really did win important victories for society. So that's my basic outline of the history of unions. Cool. Uh, so, from watching that uh, Tom Woods video, it seemed like he gave the impression that at least in the US history of unions, it was still legal for people to gather together in informal organizations and lawsuits at that time showed that people did do that. But it was, so um, do you, obviously th that would be considered a union of sorts as well. They just wouldn't have legal power to enforce their organization in any sort yeah. of, do you, do you think that would be a alternative way of producing these same ends? Or do you think that was a, a useless form of a union? Well, um, it's important to judge, like, uh, we live in much less violent times now than people did back then. Like, in an era where life was cheap and people were dying in factories, having, like, violent confrontations was very different. Like, now unions don't prop up the same way they did in the 1870s. Yeah, but they still right. ultimately rely on use of force, if it, even if it is government force today. Well, that's Generally an interesting speaking. point. Um, 
there's government involvement on both sides. There's often protections for employers as well as protections for unions, uh, which makes the muddying of this, it muddies the issue substantially. I would say ultimately, um, like your employer always want your employer always has a lot of resources to bear down on you. It's never a one on one. Like if you go up against Walmart, it's not you against the CEO of Walmart. It's you against an army of lawyers and uh, demonstrators, a PR team, a management team. Like you're up against a whole group, and uh, they it will try very hard to prevent you from gathering a similar group in a way that you can't really prevent them. Like you can't do anything to stop them from bringing their resources to bear, but they do a lot to suppress your ability to sort of bring a coalition against them. And sometimes the government needs to get involved in egregious cases in order to make that possible in the first place. Yeah, and I do think like, uh, I know Tom Woods made the, he, he stated that he believes that employers should allow or be allowed to as part of free contract prevent people from joining unions as part of the employee contract. And I don't think that that should be the case. I think that that maybe is an example of uh, trying to uh, impose trade restrictions or whatever you might call that, or like infringing on the market. I think uh, an employer should just, yeah, they necessarily should allow people to organize if they'd like. Mm -hmm. uh, so I do agree with that point, but I'm not sure if, uh, so, what would you mean by an egregious case, I guess? Is what you're um, so a modern case that's happening right now is that uh, Amazon, for example, which is a very anti-union company, uh, they have been exploring using artificial intelligence to monitor employee behaviors in their factories, or not their factories, their warehouses, I guess, and sort of use neural networks to identify people who seem like they might be discussing unions and target them for like, uh, and then they'll take that person and they'll isolate them, put them in a job where they don't talk to other people, things like that. Like there's very aggressive things being done to prevent people from want like uh, creating a union either by through a variety of means you often see like uh, resources distributed like speaking like uh, sort of propagandizing people against unions you obviously see like immense amounts of money donated to government organizations to prevent union laws or to create like pro-business laws like right to work legislation and things like that um so like uh, egregious in the sense of that, like you shouldn't have either side working against like uh, meaningful coordination. Like the idea yeah. should be that if employees want to form a union, there aren't barriers to them doing so, but that uh, perhaps people would say, and perhaps people would make the argument that unions have gone too far in the other direction and that employees don't, in a lot of cases, don't really have an option, but I think yeah. employers would make a lot of those same arguments the other way around. Like people will say, if I want to work here, I have to join the union, but then employers will turn around and say, oh, well, if you want to work in a unionized workplace, work somewhere else. Like, and they kind of want to have it both ways. Yeah. And I think I, I agree with you. That's a good point. That's a good example of uh, a company using their power to manipulate the playing field to their advantage. And I think that I want to say this tentatively because there's a good chance I haven't thought this totally through, but I'm willing to accept that as a good example of when we should try to mobilize some sort of effort to stop yeah. a company like Amazon from doing that. Um, yeah. For sure. And of course, like uh, there's two discussions to be had here. Like obviously neither of us are huge on having a giant overarching state, but uh, there's a question of like what needs to be done in the system we have for like the time being and what is sort of like an ideal to shoot for. And they aren't necessarily the same thing. Like I don't think union involvement in government is great, but until we end corporate involvement in government, there has to be union involvement or else there's an imbalance there, right? That's, right. that's one of those, yeah, very funny ethical gray area questions where once you introduce one kind of perversion of, I would say uh, an ethical state, it requires either a solution and you know, yeah. a return to more normalcy watch, or another perversion. Did you watch the, uh, oh, what the hell is it called? The PragerU video that I had in there about like uh, 
it was very much focused on this idea of like union involvement and like donation to political campaigns and things like that. I believe so. Um, and like uh, the argument, I put that in there as an example of what I thought was like a pretty egregiously one-sided view of the perspective because they say over and over again like unions are in here buying votes like they're making you give dues and then they're putting it right and yes. you're like okay but the company is doing the exact same thing on the other side they're taking yeah. value from your labor and using it to advocate against you in government like there's no until you sever that line of funding completely i think it's fair that it happens on both sides okay yeah i, I see what you're saying uh, yeah i do think that uh Yeah, I guess I do fundamentally disagree that companies should or employees should have a right to organize together and either through the government or personally violently force scabs from basically taking their jobs. I think that yeah. when you kind of create that ability, it turns the organization into a monopoly and it just creates a power structure that's just capable of abusing that for sure position and so that part i think i'm I, I think we can maybe oppose companies like amazon's ability to manipulate labor markets to their favor without allowing that particular ability so on the scabs issue like uh i agree somewhat like i'm not sure that there should be laws in place to uh protect scabbing but i think a union should have the same right that any collection does to form like a uh, exclusive contract. So I think the union should be able to say, if you fire, like, you're gonna have to fire all of us. And that might be, you know, if it's a big enough union that could be hundreds of thousands of people. And like, uh, if you wanna hire scabs, you gotta turn over your whole workforce that might perhaps be unfeasible as opposed to like uh, the model of, well, people should all have their right and no union should be able to tell people not to scab and things like that. Like uh, it's a complicated network of contracts all the time. So when it breaks down, it's difficult, but uh, I do think I do. ultimately a union needs some ability to strike or it won't be able to accomplish anything, right? Absolutely. And I do think you do have some degree of collective bargaining power with or without that exclusive contract. I do think it almost seems to me that the the nature of an exclusive contract is very similar to what an employer might be doing when they resist or present, prevent the formation of unions where they're kind of manipulating yeah. in a natural so, environment. But I suppose what you'd say is that because the disparity of power is so big between the employer and the employee, we need that different I'll standard. I'll bring up like, uh, this is an example of one of the little corners where employers have made big gains that have been to the detriment of unions. So like, if you go back to say like the 1940s, like kind of the peak era of unions, like when there was picketing, they would be right out in front of a building forming like more or less like a, a physical barrier. And that was the form that picketing took. And that was very effective because you had like a group of people and like they were able to discourage consumption, like drive consumers away as well as driving scabs away. And that was sort of the mechanism it took. And like, uh, like sometimes that turns violent. Sometimes it's just people walking around and you don't want to be seen as the guy walking through the picket line. Uh, I would obviously advocate for less violent means, but that is an example of something that corporations have fought hard to make illegal pretty much everywhere. So like if you're at a grocery store and you want to pick it, you're not allowed to stand with it in front of the door. And usually you're required now to keep like, they might say 60 feet of distance. So if you wanted to form like a barrier like that, you need 10 times as many picketers as you needed before. And it makes like the physical picketing more difficult and like any other any effort to discourage scabs becomes extremely difficult which is why unions then turn around and they leverage the same power of the government to say okay well we don't want them to be able to hire scabs then and you have like this violent back and forth like see i think i completely agree that a property owner has the right to prevent people from picketing on their property and but, i think we're kind of getting away from collective bargaining power and more towards intimidation competition which but is like uh it's not usually on the employer's property. Like it's often on a public road, like, again, oh, then I would be fine with that road or like, uh, you know, usually in modern business, it's like a strip mall that's owned by a third party that yeah. has nothing to do with either side. But, uh, there are often laws in place. Like in Alberta, for example, we have laws that there's like a certain distance you have to keep from an entrance to a business when you're picketing. 
Right. And I suppose that's a, a more of a moral gray area that's brought on by the creation of public property that's, you know, beyond my ability to... For sure. But these laws hold uh, true even on private property. Like, yeah, uh, okay. So if it was like, again, like a strip mall property owner who has nothing to do with it, he would still, like, we'd still not be allowed to pick it in front of the entrance. Yeah, and I don't like that because I like the idea of property owners defining yeah. the nature of their... Uh, what goes on in their establishment. But I do think that uh, while I support the idea of collective bargaining, I just, yeah, the idea of intimidating competitive workers does, I think whatever benefit you might get from that is outweighed by negative tendencies towards anti-competition. Just I don't disagree. Like, uh, it's very complicated. Um, I would sure. put to you perhaps that obviously the employer is able to incentivize scabs like through wages and often during a strike employers pay much higher wages to scabs to attract them to the business. Mm -hmm. um, what avenues does a union that's trying to counteract that force have to discourage scabs uh, to counterbalance that force or should they just not be involved in that discussion at all? I guess the hope is that in my mind, if if the, what the union is being offered is so low below market price, then it would be it would be a lot easier for, to get to, for them to get a lot of wide-reaching support and actually get a movement that's effective in the context of collective bargaining. But if what they're actually being offered is a pretty good deal, then uh, yeah, I tend to think that they they would have very little sway if unless their claim is a very good one because they would have to actually you know compel the surrounding society to like actually support us and to the point where there'd be very few alternative workers to step forward okay so like to characterize that you might say that like uh if an employer is able to roll over their staff and hire scabs that's an indicator that the staff is overpaid or uh like getting a good deal already if it's easy to replace them. Yeah, if, if there are lots of workers out there that you know, are, you know, want to make a life for themselves and the deal that was presented to those workers originally was actually quite good and they would look, jump at that opportunity, then I kind of, I'm, I'm yeah. inclined to say that, yeah, they should just be able to pass along the opportunity. I think that's fair. Uh, again, I would say like, Fairly common practice would be for a company to offer temporary higher wages, which sort of like circumvents that. Yeah, that's, um, that's. Yeah, so uh, it's complicated. Labor issues are always complicated because of the inherent power imbalance. Like, yeah, and it's, it's very tr tricky to find, a, uh, yeah, that yeah. medium point. Like kind uh, of uh, the theme of the whole thing is that like one person against their employer never stands a chance at all right like yeah and often like uh i think often people who are critical of uh there are industries where that is the case like as you become more skilled labor you have increasingly more value so like an accountant or a lawyer for example probably has options in a way that uh other people don't like the classic example you give is like headhunting like only happens in the upper, upper echelons of society like the idea of businesses actually competing for your labor only happens when your labor is worth like 200,000 a year. Like you're never gonna see Wendy's come to you and be like, hey, I know you're working at McDonald's, but we're offering some good benefits over here. Like take my card. I do think that happens. I mean, not, 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 not in, in the headhunting sense, but in the sense of like, uh, like in the, an example that Tom Woods gave, like of just maybe developing air conditioners or things like that, or more like just little, little benefits here and there that are gonna pull your I think that our class of workers over. I would propose to you, and maybe you'll disagree, but uh, at the lower echelons of society, it is a laborer going out and offering their labor to multiple employers, whereas the higher up you get, it becomes more of multiple employers seeking out somebody's labor. And there's, those are going to be different kinds of negotiations, obviously, by their nature. I would say you're, you're it's, it's true in a sense, but I think in both relationships, they're always going to be two-way streets because as McDonald's you're always trying to find better quality labor for less price than your competitors and you're always trying to incentivize that at the 
at lowest possible cost. And so, but there's always a little bit of, you're trying to incentivize people over it. Like, as long as you have a need for labor, as long as there's a... Like, in a theoretical sense, but I guess in a practical sense, I don't think, uh, like, let's say people who don't have a high school diploma, I don't think they have the experience of having multiple employers fight over their labor. There's usually enough unemployment at that level of society that uh, it goes the other way. Like, it's kind of people are thankful to get what they have rather than... I don't I think, think it's very true to say there's people sitting at home with like an offer from McDonald's and Wendy's like weighing the pros and cons. It's more common to see like, oh, I got something, I'll work here, they're all the same. Like, I think it probably depends largely on the state of the economy as well. Like what true. you were just what you were describing when there was a very high percentage of people moving into the cities and cheap labor was abundant. Yes. That state of things was very different than say, uh, after slaves were freed in the southern states and there's a huge surplus of labor there were still periods where every spring there would be a huge uh, uh the harvest would have or they had to plant massive amounts of seeds and so during the spring uh, all, there's a huge demand for labor and all Absolutely. the labor would get bid up and over that period so i think it depends on yeah what's the shortage of labor what's the unemployment rate yeah absolutely um for sure. I just want to get you thinking about the fact that it's like a different conversation depending on what your job is. Like, yeah. And, and, what, I, and it, what the value of your labor is. And I absolutely agree that I, I support collective bargaining because it serves the function of, to, to some degree, equaling the playing field and the disparity of power between employers and employees. Mm -hmm. I just, yeah, I'm, I'm not quite sure at what point I should draw the line because I absolutely think that there's a, there's a point where labor unions get too powerful and then they start to abuse their power to the detriment of newcomers into the industry and to the general service for everyone. Absolutely. Another thing I'll put in your head to think about is that uh, like you can't sit on labor the way you would sit on like other resources in the economy. So like if you have like a hundred pounds of diamonds, you can wait for an ideal buyer to get the most money. Whereas labor like is immediately losing its value at all times, right? Like if you are unemployed for two weeks, that's lost value that you can never get back. Mm -hmm. And so there's always an incentive for people to sell their labor at a lower rate right now than to sit right. on it and wait. It's and again, the more money sensitive. you have in the bank, the more time you can sit and wait, which gives you access, better access to the labor market. Yeah, for sure. And I think these are all you know, good reasons to support a slight shifting of the balance of power in the favor of employees mm -hmm. but yeah it's yeah and, uh, yeah it's something i'm still as i say wrapping my brain around have you it's ever worked in a unionized workplace just so i have not. not i know in my particular industry uh in pipe fitting generally people don't they, they don't like unions it's people are kind of they kind of look down on unions as kind of an interesting imposing force are there pipe fitters unions? Like there are absolutely, and you make ten dollars more in them, so an hour, an hour. So they're good to be part of. I do know people who are part of them, mm -hmm. but at least in my kind of local working culture, and I'm not even sure why, from where that cultural tendency emerged. But there's definitely an anti-union sentiment floating around. I would say uh, Alberta is yeah. anti-union. Like a yeah. stat that I'll share. So you remember the hockey lockout when like the players weren't going to play. Okay. Yeah. Uh, in the NHL. So uh, during that time, the NHL, of course, wanted to find scabs to play uh, and they just fire all the players and like hire new ones. And of all of the cities that have an NHL team, there were only two that it was legal for them to fire their whole team and hire scabs. And that was Calgary and Edmonton. <laughs> Everywhere else in the league, there was laws in place to prevent you from doing that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I mean... Even the yeah, I, states like Houston and stuff, they all have. <laughs> that's so funny. I mean, that sounds very typical of Alberta and Alberta yeah. general attitudes. So I guess, uh, would you say there's a certain point at which labor laws emerged that started to defend the workers more effectively and at a point that it makes sense? And was there a point that you think they started to go a little bit overboard? Or do you think, what do you... Um. So like I kind of touched on in my history, like labor unions became involved and like Teamsters are the famous one. Teamsters is a trucking union in the United States. Okay. They became involved with organized crime, like very like aggressively involved with organized crime. 
and uh, there certainly starts to be a point where like uh, like your union dues are not going really towards advocacy for yourself so much as they're going for like union staff and uh, things of that nature but mm -hmm. the flip side of that is always that like obviously that gets you a better deal as well I think like there's a natural uh, stopping point for unions because like if a union demands too good of a deal where it's not profitable for the company they'll just close or they'll fire the workers or whatever like i would argue that any deal that an employer can take is a fair deal because they're obviously still profiting like it's still working they're still making money they're still able to sell their product in the short term yeah yeah um yeah perhaps you could say there are long-term consequences certainly like i think Unions don't often, depending on the jurisdiction, sometimes unions have to have open books and sometimes they don't. Uh, I think that if a union is starting to spend a lot more of its money on like political leverage and things of that nature and bureaucracy, like uh, union staff that don't work in a workplace, as opposed to spending money on like bargaining lawyers, things of that nature, that's a problem. Like as with anything, if you as a participant in a union are not getting good bang for your buck, that's problematic but uh other than that i'm not sure i see i think i agree with you that there is a natural stopping point for unions when they start to be yeah over overextend themselves and they're not actually yeah. providing good services and become too bloated and bureaucratic perhaps but i think the natural at least in a, in a free market context the natural thing that would happen is that those unions would be replaced by better alternatives but i think for instance in the u.s labor market when they passed a law that said if the majority of workers in a company were unionized, then necessarily all workers in that company would, could therefore be forced into the union. Therefore, like kind of turning it into a democratic state almost, whereas if most workers in a, in a company were unionized, then it would de facto become a democracy and the minorities would be kind of forced into it. I think that undermines that natural process that we're describing because even if a union becomes bloated and inefficient, you can't just kind of jump ship to either leaving the union, just going on your own or, and that, so I think that kind of tendency, and that's, and it's kind of confusing to me because I know in my industry, that's not the case. So I, I don't know in what cases this is true yet, but I do think that that kind of switch of making it more of a state organization or more of a coercive organization, I think is where you undermine that process. So often in like, uh... The context of a skilled trade you often have a union that props up under the guise of like uh, offering superior labor so like this was what like how free the other type of union like freemasons and things like that like they come up and you say like uh you know if you hire our union you get to say this is like a union certified pipe fitter as opposed to hiring another guy who might be just as good but doesn't have that same stamp on him. That guaranteed of standard of approval kind of thing. Yeah, and, and in a and case like that, uh, I think what you're describing can be extremely effective. Like there should be natural competition because that drives the union to maintain those high standards uh, and things like that to say like, we're not, you know, cause then you don't want the, you know, United Alliance of pipe fitters to suddenly be having shitty people, then their stamp won't mean as much and people yeah. will pay the premium for that labor. They but again, to, I would question yeah. in the context of burger flippers, like there just isn't enough variety. Like employees are too interchangeable to really have those standards of quality and things like that. Like, and in those cases, it's too, again, it becomes easier for an employer to draw you away from a union. Like uh, if you're making, you know, I have no idea what a pipe fitter makes, but I imagine you make like 60 bucks an hour kind of thing. So like your employer has to offer you <laughs> whatever. <Go on>. But like, <laughs> but like uh, if you are in a skilled trade where your labor is valued, it takes a yeah. lot more to draw you away. Like if, as you said, the union pays you an extra $10 an hour. So yeah. employers have to offer you like a lot of money to draw you out of that union. Whereas in the context of like McDonald's, it would take very little to draw most people out because it's not a long-term place of employment or anything like that. So they might yeah. say, hey, we'll give you a hundred dollar gift card and that would be a lot, enough to draw people away, which again, just makes it too easy for companies to weaken a union 
I see what you're saying. So from a consumer perspective, if you're choosing to buy burgers from either a company that is run by unionized members or a company that is not, there's not a definable way in which unionized burger flippers are actually outperforming their competition. Yeah, it doesn't so like, go add with, value to the product at all. Yeah, at least from a percent perspective of a consumer. And so you're going to go with the non-unionized and that's going to undermine the formation of any kind of labor union in that context. Absolutely. That's what you're saying. And like a lot of the context, like quite honestly, and this isn't to like dig at anybody, but like most people wouldn't even know the difference walking into like a, like a, a grocery store or something. Like you wouldn't know if it was unionized or not unless you asked somebody. Like, uh, mm -hmm. whereas like dealing with like, again, like in construction or in like engineering or something like that, like it's very clear. There's often legal standards of like, you can only say you do this if you're in the union and things like that. Like uh, it's a little bit easier to see the difference. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I'm wondering what else. Okay. So like uh, I interviewed a bunch of people for this, like mm -hmm. on Facebook. Cool. Um, a common thread that I had brought up to me is that a lot of people feel that the union is to the benefit of like senior employees like there's this idea mm -hmm. in a union that you have especially in something like uh well, pretty much any industry you're going to have people who pass in and pass out and you're going to have like lifers that are there for like 50 years and there's an attitude in a lot of unions that uh um you should prioritize like these lifelong workers so in a grocery store for example like you're going to have people who work there for like 40 years and that's their career and you're going to have like kids who come in and work there for a summer and then leave and there's often an attitude in unions that they don't care as much about like uh, the short term people and like the greener employees and their priorities are more on like the aging population. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that that seems to be true. I don't know enough about like I don't have enough first hand experience to say for sure. But that that's my impression is that they tend to be gatekeepers that erect barriers to entry for newcomers that make it difficult to yeah, make as much kind of money one of the classic the talking points is that like, oh, like I never got promoted because I didn't have enough seniority and blah, blah, blah. And people correctly or incorrectly feel that the union holds them back and wants them to spend an amount of time there before they move up. Yeah, I think this is just a reflection of that. It is always a, a balancing act between creating enough of a power structure that they can defend workers' rights, but not so big that they can trample on individuals outside of that structure or actually use their power to the detriment of others. It's such a balancing point and it, I don't think you're going to have any solution to that problem as long as you're creating a power structure to defend workers. So I'm not sure there's any way around that because it's a it's a function of the actual solution in my mind. Yeah. Um, another thing you could discuss is that some unions uh, are very large like uh, if you look at the ufcw for example which is like food and commercial workers in canada alone that's like millions of workers and if you include the us it's like tens of millions and like uh, there's an idea that almost the union becomes powerful enough to really like uh take on a company like i think a union functions best often in like uh when we talk about capitalism we often talk about like small family owned businesses. And those are not a good model for unions because like the often I think that's a place where one on one uh, actually works. Like if you work for the CEO of your company directly, you can talk to him about concerns, you can get like the individual attention. But if you work for like Walmart, you're a cog in the machine, the people who make decisions about how much you get paid, and shit like that are never going to meet you in your lifetime. And so you really need like the infrastructure there to support you because you don't have like uh there isn't this idea that like oh like you know this is the best cashier at the west calgary walmart like we're gonna give him a three dollar raise like that would never happen at walmart because pay is decided like much higher up so if you want a raise you need you know the same things the company has you need lawyers you need accountants you need like people who understand it who can like advocate on your behalf yeah, I absolutely agree. <laughs> I don't know quite how to run with that, but I, yeah, I, I think that's, yeah, that's the case for sure. Is that it's not useful in the smaller context. It's useful when dealing with massive mega companies. 
Okay. Is that a term? Yeah. Mega companies? Mega companies. <laughs> Ultra companies. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as I said it. It's like, is this a Pokemon? <laughs> yeah. Mega Corp. Yeah. Um, so you talked about like your issue with like the government involvement. And I do agree that it's like a sticky point because often like the real problems you see with unions stem from their involvement in government. Uh, something that I experienced when I was in a union, and I won't say which one, but uh, there was a lot of uh, material dispensed to, or to members encouraging them to vote a certain way in every election. So like yeah. whenever there was like a city election or a provincial election or whatever, you'd get like buckets full of stuff dropped off at your location as well as sent to your home address telling you which way the union thought you should vote. Um, which I mean, like, it's not like they force you to vote a certain way, but I felt a little strange about like having propaganda dropped off. What was in the buckets? Sorry, not like uh, in not a physical bucket, but just like lots of like, like they'd come into your break room and just put like hundreds of pamphlets on the table or something like that. Oh, so like, like information, not like free swag, like. Oh, there's... you get stuff like that too. But, okay. Uh, yeah, like there's definitely, uh, I know this is a loaded term, but I would say it's fair to say there's efforts to propagandize you to like vote a certain way. Yeah. Uh, which is obviously the party that the union is supporting. Yeah, that is expected to support them. But uh, what, how do you think, uh, so we've talked kind of about what I think are the necessary government counterbalances. How would those emerge in like an emergent system? Like, Oh, well, I mean, I, I'm still kind of of the opinion that I'm not entirely sure that the government counterbalances are necessary. I think I might be, I'm, I'm still of the opinion that in the case of like Walmart employee, if it is the case that in a society, the vast majority of people are being paid very poorly for the labor they're providing, then collective bargaining and getting them together in a massive union, like a huge union is going to be very easy. Whereas yeah, it would be more difficult if that wasn't the case. And I think if we were in a kind of a nightmarish scenario where employees yeah, were getting paid terrible wages, then it would be very easy for them to rally momentum and get each other involved and create big enough structures that they could be effective in collective bargaining. And that's kind of, that's what I feel, what I believe, but I'm open to being, I'm so- in, yeah. Well, like, uh, I'll give you like a classic example, like something that happened a lot more before there was uh, protections in place to stop it from happening is that if you were caught trying to organize a union, you'd be fired from your job. Like that was yeah. grounds for dismissal. Uh, a lot of like anti-union people think that like you should be able to fire employees for trying to start a union and stuff like that. But that obviously makes it very difficult for like a grassroots movement to take root and actually accomplish that goal. So like, what would we, uh, how would we handle something like that? Yeah, I, I'm tempted to say maybe we should just try to create a legal precedent against firing people. But as you say, it's often done very sneakily with data collection, like in the case of Amazon, even if we yeah. had a law against them doing that sort of thing, it's difficult to know whether or not it's even feasible to enforce such a thing. Yeah, so, so while we're here, I'm gonna to touch on like another big union point, a pro-union cool. point in my opinion. So uh, the, Another like common complaint of unions is that like it's very difficult to fire people and unions often it, there's an impression in a unionized workplace that like uh, you can't fire people for anything and you have like the life for people that don't do anything and blah blah blah. I have a very good example of this with public school unions but that might be a topic. For yeah yeah time. well uh, in any union especially in public unions like there's definitely an attitude that's like you get the old like 64 year old chain smoking teacher on her last year and it's obviously not the same quality of education as when you get a bright eyed bushy tailed 22 year old yeah. but uh the idea that most unions would propagate is that like uh companies are able to be like too uh too selective i guess with how they fire people so like um what you often see in non-unionized workplaces is that uh you have a rule that nobody follows, for example. So like a classic example, like pretty much any workplace you're ever in, they want you to wear steel toes and maybe like 40% of people wear them. And there's the crappy like strap on steel toes in the corner that you point out to the health officer when they come. But like people are walking around without safety shit on 
And that's like an accepted thing. But then if the company wanted to get rid of someone, they would feel within their rights to like write them up and say, oh, well, we caught this guy not wearing steel toes. It's a fireable offense without applying that same standard to the employees that are perhaps viewed more favorably. So absolutely. Yeah. A union, one of the goals of a union is to say, okay, if you're going to set a workplace standard, it has to be universal. You have to say that everyone has to follow this rule. You have to make an effort to educate employees about the rule. And there has to be some like standard of enforcement, which again, is one of the ways they stop employers from saying, oh, we saw this guy organizing a union. We're going to fire him for not wearing steel toes. Like, uh, to set sort of these like objective standards in place and hold companies accountable to how they hire and fire employees. Yeah, I see what you're saying. I guess, obviously my inclination is towards just a free market approach where I want the market to just work it out. And I'm trying to entertain the idea that maybe because of the disparity of power between employers and employees, there should be some types of legislation to, yeah, do that. So I'm, 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 I'm trying not to like abandon my, you know, libertarian position while entertaining this, but I, I do see your point and I'm trying to, yeah, I'm trying to tentatively walk down this road with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not trying to corner you. I hope I'm not giving that impression. I know that. Oh, no, like, I, well, I know. Honestly, I think the purpose of this discussion would be to allow you to corner me so that I could give you my best defense of, uh, yeah. honestly, that's, yeah, I support it. <laughs> Yeah, like there's just a problem, like there's an inherent imbalance between an employer and an employee. Like by the nature of the relationship, the employer has more money than you, has like more resources at their disposal. Like you, it's never going to be as important for them to hire you as it is for you to get the job. Mm -hmm. And that's like, uh, especially when you're an unskilled laborer whose uh, labor is absolutely very much. And uh, I don't think the free market always handles it well. Although one could argue that uh, these problems of having like large pools of unskilled labor have been orchestrated by like a uh, involvement with government, I suppose. Like you hear Oftentimes. the employee Hattie type arguments that like government's trying to keep a population of willing laborers and stuff like that. Yeah, well, I mean, whether or not that is happening now, it certainly happened in the past. At certain points that we could define. So you're talking about like reformation, like there's absolutely things going on in that era to say like yeah if we want to keep these people down and cheap and like stuff like that so yeah yeah i mean i absolutely see the logic of the arguments you're making and it's the question of whether or not the dangers associated with creating unions with government power counterbalance the benefits uh that or did I phrase that right? The dangers associated with government power counterbalance the benefits of increased power for workers. It's it's a tricky it's a tricky question for sure. Do you think we could have like part of what I see as the problem is that we often treat employers and unions as entirely different animals, and there's like laws targeting one or the other. Do you think it could be possible to like uh, approach both sides in the same way, like treat them as two different collectives? dealing with each other on equal footing as opposed to like we need these specific laws to stop unions from doing these things we need these specific laws to stop companies and just sort of regulate how they negotiate like something like consistent uh like rule enforcement in a workplace i think is something that could be done outside of unions that would make it better like that stops you from just firing people you know and yeah. at will work I'm definitely actual, trying, uh, employment. I mean, right. Like, I'm, I definitely like the idea of standards being uh, more consistent and applied to more people because that it makes the laws themselves simpler. And as someone who supports generally uh, a very simple legal structure that's going to uh, emerge from the public, uh, that as simple is better because complicated different legal structures that apply to different groups differently can't really be uh, internalized by an entire population. So I. I, I like I like that version better, whether or not that can be the case, because it could be argued that it is a different scenario to be an employer like Walmart is very different than being an employee to that company. So absolutely. Yeah, I like that idea. I'm not sure if it's could be applicable. Another one I'll toss out there. This is not specific to unions, but more to like equalizing the labor market in general. A lot of people who are proponents of like universal basic income say that when you make it uh, 
so that people don't need to have a job to survive, it makes those labor markets more competitive because all of a sudden, like the alternative to working isn't starving to death, it's living a meager existence on $800 a month or whatever. And then companies have to compete with that as opposed to competing with nothing where they're always gonna win, right? Like the shittiest job in the world is better than making no money. Yeah, I mean, I guess I would make the counter argument that I would see the reason why, ultimately why people are able to not be in a position where they have to work or starve is because there's been enough wealth creation in a society that they're, they're in a better bargaining position. And it could be argued that universal basic income will ruin the incentives for wealth creation and cause everyone to have less wealth and be in more of a position where they need to take any job to survive. Or, but that could be a, you know, a long-term product of yeah, like uh, sort of the idea that it's going to spiral and all of a sudden, like, you won't be able to live on UBI unless you keep increasing it. And Which is why I like the idea of if universal basic income was a thing, it would be an emergent thing where different societies came up with different versions of it that would be voluntary and a, kind of an emergent thing. And then it, if it was financially, uh, well, unviable, then that would be okay. It would just yeah. spiral down in a localized sense. Like I would argue tying it back to like the very beginning of the labor movement, like communal land was almost a form of UBI that like if you have no valuable skills and like no land and no, nothing to your name, you can still go and like farm radishes in this like swamp and like grow enough food to survive. They were guaranteed that as being part of mem members of that area? or a Well, essentially it was like, uh, yeah, so a lord, like this is going back to like the feudal systems. So you'd have like a lord or a duke or whatever it was in your area. And like uh, he had the right to tax all of the people who lived in this area, some of whom would be landowning farmers and some of whom would have farmed on like communal land. That's land essentially owned by the government that he lets people farm on. Okay, right, yeah. Right. Like, uh, yeah. So by virtue of the arrangement, everyone was allowed to work for, yeah. Yeah. So in, that, like, in that arrangement. Yeah. Yeah, like, um, it's kind of hard to compare it because, like, in some sense, it was, like, the Lord's, like, private land, but it wasn't really seen that way until they started fencing it off and selling it. Like, right. it was more just, uh, yeah, like, an area where people could grow food, and then they'd tax, like, a small amount of whatever you grew. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, you could also work on, like, a landowning farmer's land the same way or whatever. Like, there's lots of different arrangements, but there was a general idea that, like, you'd never be without a space to grow food for yourself. Right. Yeah. Certainly an improvement in some sense. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting. Like that was really the beginning of the modern movement of like all the land is owned by somebody, you know, like there used to be everywhere, like huge swaths of land that were kind of just up for grabs. And it was like, in some sense, it was the like the government owned it, but not in the sense that like, you couldn't trespass on it or things like that. Like a forest would just be like fair game for people for the most part, or like, uh, you know, swamps, rivers, things like that. And then about 200 years ago, they started like selling all of it. It was seen more as like the Lord's private land and less of like communal land in his right. lordship or oh. district or whatever you want to call it. Lords, I tell you. I know. Can you imagine one rich guy that owns like all the land in your area and you're like subservient to his needs? Like, and you must what a crazy system. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this is like a statement about the, uh, you know, some sort of privatized land based system. Or <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's an interesting issue. Um, are there any uh, other points you wanted to? touch on uh not specifically i i think i gave my thoughts but as i said i think my thoughts are probably a lot less formed than yours are so it's hard for me to like so why don't you uh if you're comfortable like uh, do you want to talk about like your experience with the pipe fitters union and like why your thoughts on it or is that something that would affect your job like oh it, w it wouldn't affect my job but honestly i don't have enough I haven't dealt with them personally and I haven't okay. 
I, I've talked to people who have dealt with them. And yeah, I, it, I don't think I have enough, honestly, meaningful information to warrant okay. a contribution. Yeah. I was a shop steward uh, for my union for like a while. So I got to really be involved and saw like, uh, I definitely saw bad things happen in my union. Like something I would see commonly is that like, uh, if you had like a sort of a low level new employee make a complaint against like a, a more senior employee, they often took the side of the senior employee right. for better or for worse. Um, but I certainly saw like egregious things on the side of management as well. Like you'd see a sexual harassment complaint and they'd just move the guy to another store and bury the whole thing and stuff like yeah. that. Like, uh, I've heard, I've heard the expression dance of the lemons to describe similar things in public to public school teachers being moved around when their indiscretions become too much of a local controversy. Yeah. It's definitely interesting. The labor market is like, I don't know. It's struggles. <laughs> yeah, and I do think because of the nature of it, it's very complex. You can't just like it, I. I think a good argument can be made that you can't have a simple legal structure that applies to everyone because of the natural imbalance of power, especially for low-income workers. So it's, it is very exactly like I think what happens in my personal opinion, like you see a lot of wealthy people who work in skilled positions, like lawyers, accountants, uh, sort of like the well, you know, the upper echelons of our society, if you will, have very anti-union sentiments because they're not, they're very used to the idea of like, oh, like if I hate my job, I can quit and get a better one. Or like, I have a lot of options. Like I have a lot of flexibility. I could, you know, be unemployed for a couple of months without starving. And it's hard to relate to people who have very low value labor. And I think the inverse is true. Like low value labor people look at those people and don't really understand their situation either. Like, yeah, I definitely think there's part of that going on is people just don't quite empathize with scenarios outside their own. Yeah. Another issue I'll bring up that's, uh, did you watch the Bernie Sanders video? He talks about this a lot. I did. So uh, increasingly what you see companies doing, and this is again, an example of a strategy companies use. So like increasingly you see companies only hiring part-time labor. So uh, even employees that work 40 hours a week will be classified as part-time, which generally means that they're not guaranteed a certain number of hours. They don't get benefits. Oh, your door just swung open. Yeah, dog just joined me. I'm gonna go ahead <laughs> and... Uh... Um, Sorry, one moment. Yeah. Aw. So companies will like classify people as a different class of labor in order to avoid uh, giving them a lot of the benefits that they're required to give. So like there's often the government will pass a law that says like full-time employees have to have like you have to give them health care, you have to give them insurance, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, companies will just skirt that by classifying all of their employees as part-time and things like that. Yeah. What do you think of like the Tom Woods point that he made in that one video where he mentioned that oftentimes an employee will have a, a definable value on the market. And if the government tries to mess with that by saying you, like as an employer, you must provide this benefit, all the employer will do is just say, okay, well, we're going to provide that benefit, but we're also going to, you know, just switch around the benefits and costs and to where essentially the employee is still receiving the exact same package, but with in different form where they might be provided dental, but less money or less hours, but more vacation time or whatever it happens to be. But um, So first what I'll say to that, uh, I agree that that happens. Uh, it's important to note that if you're an employer and you're going to pay 100 healthcare packages for your employees, you get a much better rate on that than me as like a low wage employee going out and trying to get like an employer can get a better deal on benefits for their employees than employees can get for themselves almost without question, mm -hmm. which is why uh, like even, you know, going all the way up, like the vice president of the company gets his healthcare through the company. He might get a better package than a bricklayer, but uh, 
So there's that point. Um, but I do agree, like, I don't believe in necessarily mandating benefits for people. Um, but again, like, uh, in something like the US, where like the only way most people have access, like, they're all interlaced cogs. Like the healthcare system is so messed up in the United States, you need to have health insurance. It's not really like an option. And so like, if the government is not going to provide that, one way of ensuring people have it is to give it through their employment. Um, yeah, it's a complicated question. I do agree that oftentimes, especially benefits that aren't universally beneficial. So like if you're going to give, say, like eyeglass uh, coverage, like not everyone has eyeglasses. So if I'm an employee that doesn't have eyeglasses, that's overhead that I could be earning in wages because it's not useful to me. But there are certain benefits that are useful to everybody, like basic healthcare coverage. Mm -hmm. that I think it can be okay to expect employers to pay that. Again, you could rework the whole system and come up with something much better. But given the way it works now, uh, I gotcha. It's one of those dark intersections of government and uh, private industry that gets really yeah. fucked up really fast. Trying to improve upon an already very compromised moral situation. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, so what do you think of the idea that, um, I know a similar argument has been made with respect to insurance companies where, it, just in response to the idea that when an employer provides 100 packages, they can get a better rate than individuals. Uh, a similar thing is true with lots of companies where like with, when an insurance company provides insurance, uh, if they're working with a much bigger pool, they can provide much better rates. Oh. And so larger insurance companies tend to outperform smaller insurance companies. And this has been why some people have said, well, therefore, we should make it so that the, you know, we force everyone to, to buy from one insurance company. And the biggest, because therefore the biggest insurance company will be the most efficient. And I think the problem with this is that obviously uh, when you have a forced bureaucracy, it tends to become more corrupt and the... Well, I kind of think what you're describing is what we would call like a natural monopoly, like uh, where the barriers to entry and like uh, redundant infrastructure is going to make it like introduce a large amount of loss. Like it, what, it's similar to like water, for example. Like if you have eight different companies laying pipe all over the city, it's going to create like a, a massive amount of extra cost that's unnecessary. It's far better to have one company that owns all the pipes, right? Um, and I agree that certainly uh, there are problems that come along with that as with any monopoly. But in the case of like insurance, in particular health insurance, like I think international trends attest to the fact that having like a single government controlled healthcare option tends to result in lower costs for consumers. Um, at least in the short term, we haven't seen like 200 years of data to see what the long term trend is going to be. Well, okay, see, I, I guess I would love to learn more about this, but my perception is that uh, more competitive insurance firms tend to produce more efficient product or more competitive rates than government firms but also that's that was just my impression i i don't know well, uh, yeah i'll kind of uh this is i uh this is perhaps a biased interpretation of what has happened in the united states but i would say the united states system has led to a um a ballooning of costs because like the people when you have a situation where the person who is receiving a service is not bearing that cost directly you tend to see an inflation of those costs. So if I have health insurance and uh, I go to get, uh, you know, health care, I don't bear that cost directly. It's bared by my insurance company. And then you see insurance companies and hospitals sort of like game the system. So an insurance company says we're going to, like they agree that we're going to say this $100 operation costs $1,000 and then you're going to give me a 90% discount, which makes people who buy from the insurance company feel like they're getting a really good deal. And probably it's not a 90% discount, it's an 85% discount. So the hospital gets extra money on top. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the real losers are the people who don't have insurance because they're not part of that uh, bargaining. And so I think when you have only one insurance company, uh, everyone, like, 
that still happens and that's still a problem, but at least everyone's in on it as opposed to like the system in the US where you have people who don't have insurance that end up being big losers, which is why you see like the pictures you see circulating around where people have like a hospital bill for like $150,000 because your insurance company isn't paying that. They're paying a fraction of that, but telling you they're delivering you $150,000 worth of value in order to attract your business. Yeah, I think we just need to, I need to learn more about insurance companies and the system in the U.S. because, yeah, I feel like that's a whole other conversation. Oh, absolutely. But, uh, yeah, go ahead. No, I just, I, I'm not sure if I, I, I don't want to disagree with you because I feel like I'd be coming at a place from not knowing enough about the situation. For sure. I prefaced it like that's a very, you can see a similar thing with like uh, tuition, for example. Like, yes, uh, that's, one, that's a case in which I'm more familiar with it, yeah. So like uh, the argument for why has university tuition ballooned out of control? Well, consumers don't really bear the cost of tuition because most people get loans from the government and the government- Grants. Yeah, grants or whatever. And the government can provide as much money as they want. And then the school only has a finite number of slots. So they just keep increasing the amount and then when there's an imbalance, the government increases the amount of uh, loan available and it just sort of continues onward. Because again, like uh, the person who's actually buying the service from the university doesn't have like, the, doesn't bear the cost. And so there's no negative incentive for them to like not get like uh, that, insanely high rates. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I do, uh, I, I'm gonna have to head off here pretty soon. Um, I'm not sure if there's like a, is there anything else that you want to touch on before we do any final thoughts on this or? Um, no, I think uh, we kind of got into it. I think we had kind of a meandering one, but we touched on a lot of good stuff. That's okay. I think oftentimes when we meander, we just touch on other, they're always relevant topics. Yeah, so absolutely. It's important to realize that like all of these, like unions are a perfect example where it doesn't exist in a vacuum. And when people try yeah. to like reduce it to a vacuum, like you have one boss and one employee negotiating their wages, then of course it seems like a union is silly. But like in the real world, it's a lot more complicated than that. And uh, there's perhaps need for it. So it's important to talk about things like benefit packages, like, you know, poverty, unemployment, like they're all tied together. For sure. So I guess maybe I'll do my final thoughts and then you can end with your final words. Sure. Is that how we're Perfect. Cool. cool. Okay, yeah, I guess I would, I'm still, while well, grappling with the concept, I'm, I'm, general, I'm, I'm definitely supportive of emergent unions. I, I tend to think that they create perverse incentives and bad incentives when they become coercive and when coercive elements get introduced. And I tend to think that even low skilled workers, if they're, if their lot, if their situation is bad enough and universally bad enough, then they will easily find enough momentum to create the powerful collective bargaining structures necessary to meet companies like Walmart head on. Yeah, I can agree with that. Um, I would put out there that, uh, and I know libertarians will disagree with this, but there's an inherent coercion in the labor market in that you're in some sense required to obtain employment in order to function in our society and not like die. And so uh, I think it's important to remember that employers always have a step up on you and that they need you less than you need them. And it may be necessary to introduce a force to balance that. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. See you guys next week.